Hello there and welcome to the first edition of Metropole Webinars 2021. My name is Ndiro Ganga. It's an absolute pleasure having you, whether you're joining us live on TV or live on our social media handles and also live via uh, the webinar um, uh, login details that had been shared on our poster. Once again, welcome. The year has begun and we want to discuss redefining and realigning your finances in the year 2021. We all know that 2020 was an unprecedented year because of the COVID-19 pandemic that struck in 2019 December and spread globally in 2020. Its impact is undeniable. Kenya's economy has contracted from about over 5% in the year 2019 to negative 1.5% in 2020. And this is according to the World Bank Economic Survey of 2020. Now this does not stop here. It continues and the trickle down effect is massive, which accounts for all the job losses that we've seen in the country. And if we just paint a visual picture, unemployment rates have risen very sharply in the country. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, unemployment gap between 2019 and 2020 grew by over 10%. And that just means that over 2.5 million people were able to lose their jobs or were out of jobs in just the year 2020 due to one pandemic. This also means that one in every three Kenyans that are employed in different firms are uncertain about their future in these organizations because either the organization has not been making money, it's not profitable enough, so you do not know if the organization will keep you. And this has led to the closure of many permanent businesses, many seasonal businesses, and the income in families has significantly significantly reduce. Also, when we look at businesses, one in every three household-run businesses has had to shut down because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of these households that are running small kiosks, small businesses to sustain the family had to shut down because um, they were unable to withstand the impact of the pandemic. Now, if we look at the informal sector where these businesses fall, the informal sector employs about 83% of people in this country and contributes over 33% to the GDP. People who work in the informal sector lost over 30% of their income. This is majority of Kenyans losing a huge percentage of their income. Further, a research that was done by Stanbic Bank shows that over 65% of Kenyans had taken a pay cut. This is how severe the impact of COVID-19 is. What does this, all these job losses account to or trickle down to? Two million Kenyans slipped back to poverty. And this is according to the World Bank Economic Survey of 2020. The impact is undeniable. However, when we start the new year, how do we bounce back? How do we reposition ourselves from an individual point of view, from a corporate and from a business standpoint? How do you get back on your feet, get your money going and get your financial groove back? That's the reason why we are here and we are joined by a very able panel to help us put this into context. And our first guest is Anne Wamboy Geither. She's the CEO and founder of Rigo Africa. We'll also be joined by James K. Mbui, who is the CEO of Amica Sako. And we'll also be joined by Susan Wanjiko, who's a financial coach, and she's also the CEO of Legacy Hub KE. Ladies, thank you very much for making time and being here. And Susan, thank you. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. Now, the impact of COVID-19 has been felt across the board. And let me begin with you because you're also in wealth management. How does some of these statistics shift the financial base and financial well-being of some of the clients that have come to you and Kenyans in general? Well, um, I do have to say that definitely last year affected everybody, right? So whether you are you know, the middle class or wealthy or the poor, but everyone was really affected because this actually took a lot of people by surprise. But um, I do have to say that the people who are able to uh, maneuver the crisis and who are now starting to build back better, as I keep saying, in 2021, we're building back better. The other people who had actually done some of the right things, meaning that they were able to have been, they already had savings, this is something that I've noticed a lot of us in Kenya, we do not save, right? We do not plan for the future. So the people who actually had savings were people who were able to manage uh, manage that because a lot of us are just surviving and we are living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. As you put the statistics, about 2 million people went into poverty. That is very sad. So 
as we go forward in 2021, a lot of the discussions we've been having with my clients is how do you ensure that you actually have a, an emergency fund and how do you ensure that you have passive income so that if this thing ever happens again, then you will not, um, you'll be able to, you know, survive it all and also thrive because really that last year was terrible for everybody. But we are here, we survived it, and I think better days ahead. Mm -hmm. Great. Susan, the Kenyans were hit very hard if we look at the statistics. What are some of the reasons that we took this massive personal finance hits? What haven't we been doing right? Sorry, come again? I'm saying Kenyans have taken big hit, particularly in 2020. Some lost jobs, some took pay cuts, and it's like everything went sideways. If we looked at statistics, Kenyans were unable to pay rent, landlords were forced to waiver. If you also look at statistics that were released yesterday, about 86% of families are unsure of what they will eat and do not even have food to last them a week. Yet we've been working 2018, 2017, we were working. So what haven't we been doing right in terms of money management? Okay. Um, thank you so much um, for having me. I think one of the things that Anne has raised is a very important discussion on having savings and having emergency funds, right? Because um, I, I think a lot of people just <coughs> leave paycheck to paycheck. And one of the things that 2020 showed us is that one source of income, first of all, is too close to none. Okay, because people lost jobs. And on top of that is that majority of Kenyans for a very long time were literally one emergency away from a financial crisis, right? So I think what we have been doing wrong is that I think most Kenyans have had the concept of an emergency fund, but I don't think of people understand what an emergency fund is for a lot of us i hear people having credit cards and the reason why they have credit cards is for emergencies right but a credit card and an emergency fund are two very different things you see a lot of people um you see when there's an emergency back at home um something that is not because i, I think it is a matter of defining what exactly what is the scope of an emergency fund right when when someone's uh, when someone's your friend's car breaks down and they're stuck is that an emergency is it your emergency or is it their emergency and do you liquidate your emergency fund for that you know for that reason and so i think what the one thing we've been doing wrong is the, the whole idea of living paycheck to paycheck and a lot of people have this excuse i call it an excuse because it really is an excuse that you know we don't have enough money left to save and we don't have enough money left to invest why we do that as kenyans is because we have a mindset where we spend fast and then save mm -hmm. okay and yeah. as long as you're approaching your money with that mindset you'll never have enough to save mm -hmm. you'll never have enough left to invest because there's always something that needs your attention okay right mm -hmm. and so when you approach your finances in a way that you know rainy days can come my child can get sick i could lose my job i call it paying yourself fast and so before i spend on anything else i want to take a percentage or an amount that i've agreed on and deciding that this is going to go into my savings and into my emergency fund and then whatever is left is what i try and fit within my lifestyle mm -hmm. right yeah and so as long as we do not have a mindset of saving first and then spending later this is going to keep happening because it was just a, a very amplified situation but i think of, uh, along the years so many people have found themselves in in this it's just that this one was on a global level but people get emergencies and people's lives take uh, you know hit a standstill because of this one thing spending instead of saving fast and then spending so if we could work our finances around that i think we could we could most definitely avoid some of these things in future so i feel i feel that is the biggest thing we are doing wrong and you you're really hitting the nail on the head because we had this conversation <laughs> with a colleague with my colleagues just recently where we were saying um you should save first before you spend and the conversation is we make like there's very little money that you have to operate with you can barely cut for your expenses but i hear you now um let me bring you in and kenyans have lost some of their money i mean people have taken pay cards 65 percent of kenyans that's a huge majority of this country and the other day i was equally having a, a conversation with another peer of mine in the journalism industry 
they took a 30% pay cut and the conversation with the employer was in 2021 you'll get back the money they're yet to get back the money and then all the benefits that the government had given us in terms of relief packages have been revoked so now my colleague instead of earning a hundred percent is earning 35 percent less that makes him he has 65 percent of his revenue but his expenses are the same bills are the same he still needs to save how do you adapt to this new pay slip that you have and the money that you have at hand all right i do have to say as humans we are adaptable right so if you get a pay cut you have to adjust. You have to actually cut off what is not necessary. I know, um, especially as you keep making more money, most people tend to now start you know, living a better life and have more luxuries. Because I always tell people, once you have a pay cut, you actually have to now relook really at your finances, what we call cash flow management, which is basically budgeting. You go back to the drawing board and say, what is it that I need to do to cut these expenses? I've also been telling a lot of people that even though you got a pay cut, there are certain things that you're not spending anymore. For example, a lot of people are working from home, so you don't have to pay for transport. You don't have to pay for lunches or drinks that you used to. You're, you're not going and spending things that you used to do before. So that is a way for you to start cutting. So the thing about this is, again, just going back to your budget and saying, okay, this is my new reality. This is how much money that I am making. This is these are my expenses. Some of these expenses are fixed, right? Like there's nothing you can do about it. Say, for example, rent. You can really look at it and say, you know what? I'm living in this neighborhood, which is quite expensive. Can I change and now go to another neighborhood whereby it is less expensive? So you have to readjust because, again, in a new normal, you can do things the way it used to. That's what I've been telling a lot of people to do. If you have a pay cut, be mindful about that. The other thing, and um, and um, Wanjiko, I think, uh, alluded to it around the fact that um, that uh, people need to start thinking about multiple sources of income. If you only have one job or one source of income, it can be taken away from you. So another conversation we should be having as Kenyans is, okay, and a lot of people have that. A lot of people have side hustles. So I think you should be asking yourself, okay, even as I manage my budget, do I have another source of income that I get so that I can be able to make more money? Mm -hmm. And I've been telling a lot of people, it doesn't have to be just local, right? It actually can be international. You could actually be doing business online and making money from around the world. So again, um, the opportunities that I am seeing is even though you have to do some drastic things with your budget, there are also opportunities when it comes to making more money through multiple sources of income, and that's the way you're going to be able to survive and thrive. So to, to just play devil's advocate here, particularly for the person who might be watching and ha does not have a lot of information on personal finance, when you say there are things that you can cut out, these are probably wants because needs are yeah. a given. What are some of these yeah. things um, and things that you can afford but now cannot afford and you can live without that you should cut out of your budget? Okay, so I say basic. Food is important, right? Mm -hmm. Shelter is important. Those kind of things you can't do, can't do without. Like I said, if, for example, you're living in money and you can't afford rent anymore and it's not a mortgage, you can actually move to another food, which is cheaper, right? So if it's food, maybe you used to eat out or used to, you know, go and you're eating, you know, meat every day and lobster, whatever it is, extra, right? Um, or is really extra expensive. stuff. You can now reduce it and now you're taking Ugalian Skumawiki. So what I'm just saying is you can actually just say, look, um, I can reduce where I need to reduce, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And a lot of the times when we look at it critically, there's a way to cut off some of those expenses. And I've experienced it myself, you know? I like certain things. I like going certain places. But because when now I became cautious about my money, I had to reduce it. I had to reduce my expenses because I realized for me to survive and survive this crisis and thrive in the future, I have to cut off the extras. Mm -hmm. You have to cut off the extras. And a lot of us are living beyond our means. A lot of us are keeping up with the Joneses. A lot of us are doing sometimes things that are not necessary. Mm -hmm. So that's what you need to start doing. And that's why you need to write it down. Okay. You need to actually keep track and say, these are my necessities. This is what I am spending. School fees, food. You know, you write it down. Then the extras. I don't have to buy new clothes. 
right? I don't have to go to the salon. I, I, there are certain things you don't have to. That's what you cut off. Mm -hmm. Susan, let me, example, let me bring you in, Susan. Um, we've talked about those who've lost a particular amount of their income, but there are 2.5 million Kenyans that lost their job. And I, I, I have gone through this myself. I've been fired before. And it's, it's, it's honestly not a good feeling, and it's not a good place to be. And the first thing that we think about is, how am I going to survive? And money economics begin ringing in your head like never before. For that person who's been fired or they lost their job, money-wise, where do they start? How do they arrange their financial books? Okay, um, that's a very good question. Um, one of the things that I, I think, and Anne has already touched on this, is sizing. There's no other place to start when you lose your job other than downsizing, right? So you want to, first of all, evaluate because at that particular moment when you lose your job, you want to check what you have in your war chest okay check how many say how much do i have in savings right how much money do i have if your employer um gave you a send off package some are doing some employers are not doing anything at all some are doing two to three months and then what you want to do now is kind of like to do is clearly define what your needs and wants are that people saying i need this or do you know what a need is? You know what? And so, and of course, needs and wants are very relevant, depending on an individual, right? So you want to clearly and very objectively have a conversation with yourself to identify what needs are at this particular point in your life and what wants are. And then once you've been able to kind of literally, as Annie saying, write down a list of needs and wants and things you're doing away with completely, they're not even making it to the wants list. The second thing you want to check is now, um, in tandem with these needs and wants, what do I have in my war chest? This is the amount of money that I have. And then look at the basic necessities that you know for a fact you cannot do without. First thing, you need housing. Second thing is food. If you have children, you probably have a conversation either with school because one of the things I see that really uh, drags us down when we lose our jobs is a secret. Right. And, and this is one of the things that I, even as I'm a client, I tell people money and job loss or whether you whatever, how much you earn, you earn is it's more mental and emotional than we care to admit. Right. And to, to kind of like let the information be out there that, you know what, I just I just lost my income. And if we did that, the able to get reprieve on some areas of our lives. Mm -hmm. I know schools that would allow a period up until you're able to organize yourself. I know creditors a break from your loan repayments, right? Just because you've been honest. So the first thing as we've analyze your needs and wants, look at what is on your watches. And then the third thing, communicate to people, the people that you pay, the people that need to know that I no longer come and this is happening the fourth and the most important thing to do is look at and look at your expertise see what you can start to have i tell people time and time again the reason why people are not successful is we have two terrible mindsets the first mindset is i can't be a hustler because we think starting a so means you're being a hustler right mm -hmm. thinking side hats or overthinking of income i know someone who does picnic experiences you know for them they like outdoors and that's what they started doing i know someone who's tutoring i personally talk to people about their pipes and their businesses for a living monday to monday this is my job right and so when you when you gather yourself and you look at what am i trained in it occurs naturally to me i believe that anything can be monetized with the right mindset right mm -hmm. but the whole point is this don't start looking for loans to start business just think big but start small and start now mm -hmm. the most important work right now with what i have mm -hmm. and then of course ask for help with regards to the family around you that could either give you soft loans or maybe push you in that because sitting at home and mopping about it doesn't solve the situation first of all you know build up on it until you can get to a point where you're asking yourself what can i do to make money that would help me cover my most immediate needs mm -hmm. and expenses
Great. Now, whether you've lost your job or not, the World Bank says that income in the country reduced from 1,899 per capita, this is per person, and it has dropped by 3.3% in 2020 to 1,826. And for 2021, it's likely to drop further and in 2022 also drop further. So the GDP per capita, the income that every Kenyan will be getting is set to drop as the days go by instead of increasing. And I want to bring you in in here now we know that akuna pesa it end like reduce how do you budget and budgeting you know budgeting is is really easy when you think about it but when you sit down to start calculating and you see where your money goes you're like eh, yeah, yeah. the mathematics is not making sense so how do you budget what do you put in how much do you put in there how do you budget for this money to ensure that all fronts of your life are taken care of not just today but tomorrow too Okay, I, I will first start off by saying, I mean, those statistics you now, they are quite dire, right? So it's very negative. Everything is, looks like to become bad, bad, but I think maybe I'm optimistic. I feel like there's so much potential, especially because of the opportunities we're seeing with the Africa continent, opportunities we're seeing in digital economy. There are so many opportunities out there. So they'll be saying something but I think that every individual has the ability to own reality and do things well. So even before I go to the questions about budgeting, I really want to say that if you've lost your job, you have to adjust to reality. And now, even before you start thinking about another job, you need to have if you had a side hustle, be working in the side hustle. And also I've been encouraging a lot of people to have family businesses. So if, if you're in a family with, a, with already a family business, Go in and start seeing how you can add value into that family business because that is how that the economy will grow and will make money. Because the reason you're seeing the statistics very bad is because people are saying there is no money. But the way the economy grows is is if you make money, you go and spend, right? So some change. People start spending again. They believe that they're going Going back to what you're asking about budget, if you can look at your finances and you cannot make sense of it, I'll say, I don't even know where I can cut. That is when you go into a wealth advisor or a wealth from another perspective, right? So that when you look at it in reality and ask you some quick questions, and really, do you have to spend this amount, right? They will be able to put you into your reality because Honestly, if you go in and you try and start budgeting, everything that is, is ne maybe hard for you to make that decision yourself. So now you need to go to an ex who actually sit down with you an hour or two. And by the time you come out from that session, it's quite clear what is the need, the want, what it is that you need to do next in order for you to now make more money. Then we'll go, that you can go back to your own like that. Mm -hmm. But you need to ensure that you adjust to your reality. Mm -hmm. That's why I say, and the budget keeps you in reality. It is very clear. This is my income. This is my expenses. This is what I'm saving. This is what I'm doing. And if you roll down, <laughs> yeah. Susan, is, is, do you think or have you encountered a model in your years of financial coaching? Is there probably a universal model that somebody can use as the basic principle for budgeting? Expenses take certain percentage, saving certain percentage, uh, and maybe leisure a certain percentage? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I, I would love to just point out is a lot of people think um, having a list of expenses or a list of budgeting that is not budgeting right um one of my favorite um you know financial brains is is dave ramsey and he says that budgeting is telling you instead of wondering where it went right? and so when you're thinking about budgeting, four important things to budgeting the first thing is investments okay as we said we are paying ourselves first we are paying the mindset let's not just or mandatory bills and expenses okay so savings and investments the second thing is debt repayments especially if you're in debt and you're trying to get out of debt that's very key. cause that that thing we have mandatory bills expenses and the fourth thing is we have once and leisure it's very unrealistic for you not to have a budget for once and leisure because even if i just decide to leave my house and go have tea with Anne, and i spent 70 shillings only that's money that 
taken out of my um, budget, okay? And so there's a, there's a budgeting rule that is called the 50-30-20 budgeting rule, okay? So the 50-30-20 budgeting rule just stipulates that 50 of your, um, that is net income, 50% of your net income should cater for mandatory bill expenses, okay? And then we have 30% covering um, savings, investments, and debt repayments. So out of the 30%, you could maybe do, let's say, 10 going into debt repayments, 10% going into savings, and another 10% into investments now i'm sure a lot of uh, maybe some people in, in who have joined us today are wondering what's the difference between it's a very big difference saving is capital preservation if i put fifty thousand here and i come back 60 months later six months later i'm gonna get my fifty thousand but investing is growing my money investing is putting my money in an asset that by the time i come back six months or one year later i no longer have the fifty thousand that I put in okay i have what i have maybe 70 or my money has grown now before we even get into the other percentage let me just weigh in on uh, saving and investing and and the differences and why both of them need to come in now why do you need to invest why do you need to take investing seriously you need to take investing seriously no matter how little your income is because of something called inflation mm -hmm. inflation is the rate at which goods and services the prices of goods and services are going up on an annual basis now i want to i want to give you an example of the rate of inflation assuming the rate of inflation in kenya is at six percent per annum what does that tell me as a consumer this tells me that if inflation is growing at six percent per annum the prices of goods services and commodities will go up by six percent so this tells me if I am to at least be able to stand with where at least a six percent am return on my money. Because if I get less, what does that mean? It means that I cannot even be able to sustain my current standard of living next year or in two years from live and live improving and this is why i tell even young people who are earning twenty thousand or thirty thousand think of it. i th by someone the uh, investment in they will tell you such as money market that uh, you still preserve your capital but at the same time they give you an interest that compensates you for inflation and so that is the difference between savings and investments so you can have 10 percent of your money going into investments and then another 10 percent going into savings why do you need to you need to save because there are some non-monthly expenditures that come up such as car insurance but we them and we need to save for them this is one of the things i teach in my classes and we talk about building sinking and sinking funds are just savings accounts that help you to be able to afford your lifestyle throughout the year mm -hmm. okay so we are still on the 50 30 20 so we said 50 covers your mandatory bills and expenses 30 percent covers your savings investments and debts and then now we have 20 percent covering your work okay and if people who like themselves clothes and makeup and candles whatever it is that you know serves you right now this is just a rule of thumb eh? 50 30 20 is a rule of thumb depending on the stage of life that you are you could decide to switch it up okay so assuming like currently myself i am just now starting my family not have kids it's just myself and maybe my spouse um currently what we are doing is that instead of 50 percent on bills and is we are saving 50% and investing because we are cognizant of the fact that a time will come that we will have school fees and we will have things be able to save up. And so you can play around with the percentages depending on what stage of life you are in. So when you're budgeting, those are the four things that I'd, you know, I'd really advise that you strongly consider regardless of your income. Okay? And maybe one last thing I could say is that if you're Mandatory bills and expenses exceed 50% of your income. That is a sign that you're living up your means. A life you cannot you afford.
and you cannot afford your lifestyle and so that means you need to bring it you need to bring it all the way down yeah but, if... and in fact if your rent is more than 25 percent of your net income you cannot afford the house you're living that, that's okay. a lot that's a lot of math that's a lot of <laughs> math that we have to do say the basic salary yeah. for many kenyans in employment is about a hundred thousand which means yeah. your net will be seventy five thousand so how much yeah. should your rent be where do you cap your rent your rent your rent should be at at least a minimum of 25 percent of your net income that should it shouldn't go past that so that means if you if you have a net of 75 your rent should be about 15 to twenty thousand. Oh yes, yes, okay. yeah. And so you see that those kinds of realities when you call yourself for that kind of meeting and you actually do the math, you'll realize a lot of us cannot afford the houses we live in. Mm -hmm. A lot of us cannot afford the cars we are driving. A lot of us cannot afford living in the neighborhoods that we live in. And so when you're cognizant, I keep telling people, when you find yourself living paycheck, it is a spending problem. Okay. What need to address spending. Okay, so and my we, my director is telling me, let us also talk about Tulem Tuako Kochini. Probably you're yeah. making 24,000 who have not been taxed, so currently they're tax free. Of your yeah. 24,000, if we're doing with 50, 12,000 will go to your bills. Mandatory bills and expenses. And then about 8,000 will go to saving investment and debt. And yeah. then now 20%, which will be about 4,000, will go to luxury. Enjoyment. Exactly. That's what you're using. And then you see. So you have is... to limit your enjoyment to 4,000. Then now, here, here now is the catch. Who says you have to? You see, this is where the conversations on additional streams of income come in. I'm never an advocate. If you ask me what I would pick between cutting costs and making more money, I would definitely the making money option and you see that is the mindset that we need to embrace as kenyans that is what the 844 system is not teaching us we are trained to just be employees right at what point do you because i keep telling people even as i'm working with my clients we always hit up a place where we cannot cut expenses any lower than what we have cut and there's still not enough money so the next conversation we need to have with ourselves is how can i generate additional streams of income mm -hmm. and we'll get to and that in a bit but yes. there's something that you've mentioned which is very important that there's a level where you cannot cut your expenses below exactly. and when the year was starting i tried to yeah. do that i sat down with my budget and i yeah. cut and i cut and i cut but i still couldn't hit my saving targets and it only yeah. occurred to me that even if i took my whole salary and say, oh, yeah. I still won't hit my saving targets. Exactly. And it was time to diversify my sources of income. Exactly. So that, what you, that is what that informs you. And, and uh, uh, just uh, adding there, Adira, because that's something I talk about all the time. Go it's, ahead. Reality is we don't have enough money, right? Oh. right? We will never be satisfied, right? Even somebody, and, and, and let me tell you, the person who at the bottom there, if they got a wheelbarrow or a car, they feel like they have achieved They're in the middle class. That's not the range road. And are you with us? Actually, she mentioned earlier, if you have to have a budget for the income that you make, let's say, for example, salary, any other luxury, right? If you want to spend extra stuff, then you actually have an additional source of income, which is a those dividends or those what you use that you need to do is what you get from the extra money mm -hmm. but you spend on every month has to be in reality in month. Mm -hmm. because if you do mm -hmm. not do if you if you find your stretch what you're going to do you're gonna start borrowing money and we see that's the problem right now in Kenya People have a lot people on the branch, the talent. People are not that's because when they were taking it, they had no plans of how they just knew that they needed that money and so they took that it was easily accessible. Mm -hmm. But now when it's time to pay back, they don't know how to pay back. Mm -hmm. Can three from mm -hmm. loans for people. So again, we need to look even as we're talking about budgeting and um 
making additional income. We, the first thing, and I always tell people because we're all about creating wealth, if you have, that will kill any chances of you actually need to eliminate that. However, so you can. So if budget, you need to, for us, let's say, at least 10% needs to be paying off your debt. Mm -hmm. One by one, one by one, because as you pay off your debt, then you. Susan, I'm really, uh, and rather, I'm having trouble making out what you're saying. If you don't mind, maybe you could restart your internet. As you do that, Susan, she's mentioned something very pertinent. And you said in the 30% that goes into saving debt and investment, you should at least put aside some money to take care of your debt. Now, I recently saw a meme that said, shout out to us who count Fuliza as cash at hand. We've become a borrowing society where the solution to our inadequacy in finances is you borrow and then you borrow from Tala, you pay branch, then you borrow from another app, you pay branch. And this is sort of a very risky cycle because you're sort of in an endless debt cycle that you'll never break free from. Mm -hmm. The thing about debt, when you get yourself into that vicious cycle is, is very challenging, right? And, you know, I want who are stuck in debt you know you borrow time to pay brand and then bolo, you borrow branched and you have like you know crb looking for you phone calls every you know just and this is why living you within your means and let me we 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 are you let me just put it that way we are you're lowering ourselves into bankruptcy yeah because uh, even when you you took out the debt in the first place. Sometimes I, I, I do um, sensitive. I am cognizant of the fact that some people take it out because your child needs food. And I'm cognizant of the fact that people take these things out because your child needs to go to school or you need right? And so when you're thinking about how to get out of yeah, you need to start paying off the debt, but at the same time you need to ensure paying out of debt. Because you cannot be trying to pay debt. That, that is not how to have a line out to pay for that particular loan, right? And so that is not how to get out of debt. The most effective way to try and get out of debt is to repay the debt slowly while still ensuring that you're not into any more debt. And so that means you need to limit yourself to a budget, right? Mm -hmm. Living within your means is one of the most. Um, I, I don't know any other way of of staying out of debt other than ensuring that you're living within your means and actually do. And if we didn't care about people's opinions, if we didn't care about societal, we would live within our means, right? And for me, one of my favorite mantras as a finance, as an individual is that people's opinions don't pay my bill. I'm not going to be trying to bend over backwards to, you know, so that people can say I live in Rwanda. But you know, Instagram can say, give you pressure. Everyone right now exactly. is in post. Exactly. And, and exactly. That is a very good question. We Susan, are you with me? Okay, we'll come back to Susan just a little bit. Probably she's gone to Instagram to drag all of you who are drooling over people's pictures that are in the coast. James has just joined us. James, if you can hear me, thank you very much for making time challenges of technology. But we are very glad to see you're here. We are discussing debt, and I think you found the conversation at a really great place. How does the loan book for your circle and circles look like, particularly in 2020, where people were sort of did not have enough money to go by and relied on borrowing and even businesses were going through it and most of them relied on borrowing how did the loan book look like and how was the relationship credit relationship between you and some of your clients um thank you very much uh, for that question um 2020 was definitely a very very big idea for majority of uh, member and uh, the, and especially people who had uh, borrowed loans and uh, so what happened, very many people lost their jobs, uh, many businesses were closed, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, life was not what people are used to. And, and a lot of us were suffering because that is not, uh, every place was, was suffering. Uh, people were meant to be, to stay in their houses, uh, which is very unusual. Children had been, and so forth. 
and uh, a lot of uh, our members coming to structure either laws or they closed because they had closed their businesses and especially schools who are our members uh, a lot of them up to this been able to recover from the effects of the COVID-19 uh, especially because of uh, the prolonged period of uh, uh, school closure uh, and, and because of course they were not having any, any incomes coming through and of course when they opened schools they had a lot of other things that they had to do they had to comply with the protocol of and so they were required to spend quite a bit of money. Some mm -hmm. of them had to come for additional loans as advances so that they could um, uh, comply with the COVID-19 protocols. Uh, and, and generally, we had to have uh, to have to restructure a lot of those loans for individuals. We restructured loans for uh, for for businesses. We also had to come up with some new products so that we could um, try to support uh, families. Uh, individuals they were borrowed they were borrowing emergency loans and even as we were borrowing emergency loans we had difficult times because we were, we were borrowing loans some of them did not even have incomes and we had to see we saw a lot of um, uh, members coming to withdraw some of their savings that uh, especially for those having some savings for emergencies a lot of those monies were withdrawn um, uh, in, the, in the year 2020. But also, interestingly, <coughs> for, for, for quite a number of people, we saw also a lot of people coming to deposit money because people were unsure about tomorrow. And so everybody was trying to save whatever little money they had. We have seen people becoming very cautious about their expenditure. Remember, there was a time we got to a point where uh, you could go to hospital, the hospitals were not there. Uh, you could not even get a hospital bed, you could not get an ICU bed, and people were a little bit careful. Again, we had issues uh, because um, uh, we also had people who uh, were, were unable to repay loans even before COVID-19 came. And uh, again, we could not stop. We were trying to sell their, uh, to auction their properties and so on. But again, it was not easy for even an auctioneer to get a buyer. Even up to this minute, uh, that has not recovered. We are still having challenges, uh, um, even even auctioning properties for people who are completely unable to pay uh, their, their 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 loans. If you look at uh, the the the, the dailies, you'll find a lot of uh, auctioneers trying to put things for sale, and they cannot be able to actually get buyers. And therefore, it has not um, been a very easy easy period of time, and it is a learning time for all of us that we have these things that we are talking about that we keep telling people. That is important for you to have an emergency fund. It became a reality in 2020. It is important for you to save as you can. It became a reality in 2020. And especially for business people. Business people do not appreciate the need for savings. They actually believe in just doing business rather than saving and investing. And when they invest, they, they just think in terms of investing uh, in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in, in properties like... Um, uh, rental houses and so on. Mm -hmm. But again, what we saw in 2020, even rental houses, the, uh, the rents were not being paid. Yes. But those people who had uh, invested and saved money in uh, in financial institutions, those people were in better place than people who had uh, put in investments uh, elsewhere. And therefore, it was a learning period for all of us, okay. uh, businesses, financial institutions, mm -hmm. and, and everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know if you've joined us back. We are doing the final home run. And I want, I want to talk to you briefly on investment, as James has mentioned, traditional asset classes versus the sort of the new model of investment, the money markets fund, buying treasury bonds, buying stocks, briefly. Because people can earn dividends from this. Though 2020, we saw many companies opted not to pay dividends because of reasons that we can all understand. Some did. But where do you start in terms of investing? Uh, and you can weigh out the options very briefly. Traditional asset classes merged with the new asset classes that we're seeing. Okay. Thank you very much. This is a subject I talk about all the time. I want to start off by saying when you're looking at your investment, you need to diversify your portfolio. As the gentleman earlier mentioned, a lot of people traditionally, everyone put their money in real estate, whether in land, which doesn't you know, generate any income, which I always say you want to manage that. 
But also a lot of people thought like, you know what, if I have rental property, be it residential or commercial, I will always have income coming in. And that's part of what we encourage people to do about passive income. But last year, we realized that if people cannot pay rent, then you don't have that income, right? So again, when we're talking about diversifying your portfolio, you need to look at different asset classes. So real estate is one asset class, but then now you need to start looking at, for example, now more liquid assets or more money managed funds, right? So if you want to have an emergency fund, I personally encourage everyone to put it in a money market fund. I always tell people you need to put at least, before I used to say three to six months, but now we're saying six to 12 months, just because of COVID. So you want to put that into a money market fund. What a money market fund is, it is a fund that is managed by a licensed fund manager who is licensed by the Capital Markets Authority. And the great thing about funds and what a lot of people to invest in money market funds is the fact that most of the investments that are put in this money market fund are one, are very secure. So you'll see that these fund managers are putting money in government bonds, treasury bills, I mean. They're putting this money in banks. They're putting this money in commercial paper. They're putting them in short-term securities, which if you went yourself to the bank, they'll probably give you 5% or 2%. But then because you go with a fund manager, the fund manager is able to get higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. So that is why you want to have the money in a money market fund. Okay. You want to put some of the money in a income fund. So what I'm going, you have to diversify your portfolio. You can't say everything is in really. You have mm -hmm. to say, I need some money where I can access it when I need it. And so you diversify your portfolio so that if one part, of the one asset class is affected, then you still have money that you can be able to access. Okay. So you always have to look at your investment portfolio holistically and you want to work with a um, wealth advisor who can be able to advise you with that. And Anne herself is a wealth advisor. We'll attach all her details on our social media platforms. Susan, you're parting short. Something you're very passionate about, an emergency fund. 2020 would cannot beat any other year that has taught us the importance of an emergency fund. How much money goes into it? How long does it take to mature? And under what circumstances do you go to your emergency fund to sort your emergency? All right. So what you do is that you want to look at what your total living expenses are in a month. OK. And so if my total living expenses and when we say total living expenses, we don't just mean mandatory bills and expenses like rent and food. You want to check um, if I'm servicing my savings, investments and debt repayments and I'm paying my mandatory bills and expenses and I'm having coffee or going to the salon. What does all that amount to? That is that is what your total living expenses are. And so when you realize that that is 50,000, um, the next question you want to ask yourself I want you know how much do I want to have as an emergency fund and as Anne has said the recommend but as someone who's starting out let's say you do not have an Susan are you with us you can hear me yes go ahead all right so as I was saying if my total living expenses are 50,000 every month and I want to have a six months emergency fund that means that my target for my emergency fund needs to be 300,000 okay so what you do is that you ask yourself how long would I need to build an emergency fund of 300,000 so you can be putting 10,000 or 20,000 however much 1,000 or 2,000 depending on the percent talked about and how much you're actually earning so this is how you build an emergency fund one of the things that i like telling my clients as a disclaimer is that please don't push yourself to build an emergency fund overnight okay it it is a process you fund your emergency fund on a monthly basis as a mandatory bill the same way you would pay for rent eventually you be it becomes second nature Okay, and so that is where you want to start. And then at what circumstance do you liquidate your emergency fund? Personally, emergencies are defined as if I have been affected either physically because I am sick and I'm not able to make an income anymore or that someone is in hospital and it is a life and death issue. That is a scenario where I would liquidate my emergency fund. If I lost my job and I've, all my savings are liquidated, that is an emergency. If, you know, that this major repairs, like, I mean, if your door in the house, you know, just collapses and you need to fix that. So emergencies, I think it is just a matter 
matter of sitting and asking yourself, would I do without this thing? If you can do without it, then it's not an emergency. But if you if, if you cannot absolutely not do without it, or someone will die without you actually doing something about it, then that is an emergency. But mm -hmm. when you know you are broken you need to fix it that's not an emergency uh, you know or when let's say Anne has a baby shower and i didn't know about it so i need to attend that's not an emergency or you know one of my nails broke I need to go fix it that's not an emergency we mm -hmm. need to we need to take our finances seriously and actually be able to define um what emergencies are and what they're not and maybe as i just conclude i mentioned something important on on investments and i just want to add on to something please don't invest because people are telling you that this thing has money or this is where the money is or this is i'm a strong believer that your investment choices have to be informed for financial goals okay and so what are my financial goals i want to retire early then i need to invest in a pension fund what is my other financial goal i need to have an emergency fund so i'll put some money in an in a money market fund what is my other financial goal i want to own property and to buy land in the next five years i go to amica and ask them to open a circle for me so that i could be able to have some credit facilities as and when i need to buy uh you know a high um you know a, you know like high investment kind of like asset right so don't just you know i see a lot of people saying you know jumping from one share to another from one company to another you need to let your investment choices to be guided by your financial goals so we don't start by asking people what are the best financial investment options you start by asking yourself what are my financial goals okay thank and then you, you uh, exactly and then now you find out which investment options are in alignment with your financial goals. Oh my God, what a way to finish that. Susan Wanjiko, she is a personal finance, co finance coach rather, and also the CEO of the Legacy Hub KE. Finally, James, 30 seconds, because that's all my director, Richard, is going to allow me. 2021, how is Amica going to help its SACO members and even those who are not in their SACO to bounce back financially? 30 seconds, please. James, are you with us? Okay, great. That's where we leave it. Unfortunately, we couldn't get a hold of James. Susan Wanjiko and Anne Gaither, thank you very much for making time and being here and sharing some of these gems. This is just a tip on the iceberg of personal finance. We've opened the book, but there are a million and one other chapters that you should read. And to do that, you can always reach out to the two ladies, respectively, Anne Gaither on Instagram, Susan.Wanjiko underscore on Instagram. And also, I, I was just Googling Susan. When you type the Legacy Hub KE, she pops up. She, so she's done aggressive branding online talk to them you can book a session with them and they can take you through this once again thank you very much for watching my name is ondiro ganga i'll see you again on the next edition of metropole webinars